Yes. Nicole Prune? Probably. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again for everybody that's present here today. I would like to thank you again the invitation to be sharing this work. And what I'm going to talk about today is something that's, as the title says, beyond the shell. We're going to be talking about formiliferal coatings and how they could um, cycle, trace cycle changes, element cycle changes over the past. Um, sorry, it's not coming. But uh, uh, what I'm calling formiliferal coatings at this time is the autogenic oxides precipitated. It can be in other forms of autogenics, but what I'm present today, it will be the autogenic oxides. They precipitated in formiliferal shell at the sediment water interface. And of course, as we are talking about oxides, we must have um, great oxygen concentration in this environment for uh, being an environment that could the oxides being precipitated, precipitated. And in this case of this um, um, image that you're seeing here, it's just trying to illustrate the manganese oxides precipitation in the interface between water sediments. So it means that we have the manganese available in sediments and also manganese that's being delivered by the particles. And we have also manganese and uh, uh, bottom waters. And then during the, um, in an environment with oxic conditions, we do have then the precipitation of manganese oxides that uh, roughly um, are represented as uh, this yellow um, um, surrounding thing. But how actually these uh, autogenic oxides are precipitated? So uh, this work of Pena and the uh, co-authors um, doing uh, electron mapping, they are showing here uh, that uh, we do have this precipitation not exactly uh, covering the shell. We do have that's in the inner part of the shell. Uh, when we do have the increase in um, concentration and CPS of manganese and also iron. And we also have some um, presence of this uh, high, uh, these warm colors around the pore. So this means that we can have also precipitated precipitation of oxides in the pores. And uh, together with these oxide precipitations, we can have some elements associated as, for example, magnesium here. So that's why the title of this work and uh, uh, name is this autogenic part as contaminant. And indeed, if we go through and analyze the calcite of the formifera, we need to clean to uh, exclude these contaminants because they are going to overlap the concentrations uh, from the formifera calcite. And then extensive uh, cleaning protocols are, are proceeded to try to remove that. But uh, these autogenic uh, precipitations can also tell us something about primary changes in the formifera, uh, actually primary changes in the in our environment. So we can also have some um, association of these elements to, um, uh, we can have association uh, of different elements to these autogenic oxides. In this other work, the example is uh, um, it's the neodymium herefilaments. Then they also can be associated with the oxides, as you can see here, and also the elect electron mapping. We here have an image uh, showing the iron uh, reach from voids and the pores. And we see that uh, we have um, higher uh, CPS of um, neodymium. Um, in this um, image here in your uh, left hand side, so this is on the pause in your right uh, hand side, you see that we have patches, manganese iron rich patches that also neodymium are also assimilated to that as you can see here in this the gray, uh, dark gray bands here. So, but uh, this higher filaments, um, can be also um, addressed looking for the concentrations. Here we are comparing in this work of Natalie Roberts, uh, they compared uh, the concentrations from the calcite, mainly uh, considering the sediment trap and plankton tau, uh, uh, planktonic foraminifera, and comparing that to foraminifera co uh, coatings. That means the sediment, uh, sedimentary planktonic foraminifera that's unclean. So you, what you can see here from this graph is that, that we have a huge difference in concentration of manganese and also neodymium. 
um, that's increased a lot. So it's increasing like a uh, tenfold and uh, uh, comparing the plankton tile concentrations to the sedimentary uh, foraminifera that now is named as foraminifera coatings here. But for those that are not so familiar with her filaments, um, are those elements that's part of from the Lantanidium series. So uh, we have uh, different groups of uh, herofilaments that I'm going to uh, be talking today. So we do have the light herofilaments that are, are those in the beginning of the Lantanidium series. And we have the mid herofilaments and also the have herofilaments. So we can work with the, the ratio between these light and have herofilaments so that they can tell us something about the environment. Um, and the most famous, at least in oceanography, uh, is the neodymium um, because it's well applied for uh, isotopes. The isotopes of neodymium is well applied to trace uh, changes in ocean circulation. And um, when we look for the profiles of her filaments, so we do have here the light and have her filaments, we see that different phase, phases express different um, shapes of the hera filaments profiles that we can see here in iron manganese cross, cross clays, autogenic carbonates. And here by the last, we can see seawater. So seawater is tablet and uh, um, light hera filaments, but it's enriched in heavy hera filaments. So this comes with the shape. But what is important for you understand here and look at this picture is that we have some uh, uh, peaks, uh, in this case of negative peaks here, exactly on serum. And then there's a difference between uh, element uh, in relation to the neighbors. Uh, we name it as an anomaly. So in this case, as the serum, we name the serum anomaly. That's what I'm going to be talking after too. But uh, uh, how the forums uh, get this herofilament signature? So, um, they are reflecting seawater um, her filaments pattern. In this work uh, here um, of uh, Annie and co-authors, they look at um, started looking for the foraminiferal coatings that are um, represented for the filled and unfilled dots here, and it's three graphs. And starting with have light her filaments ratio, the mid her filaments anomaly, and also the serial anomaly by the less. And then we have then the from nephral coatings here represented with dots. And the seawater is represented by this black continuous line. And then what we can see that from nephral coatings represents the seawater pattern, but it's fractionated. And uh, what they tried to, to do in this work was try to model which phase could be causing this scavenging, the, sorry, could be causing the fractionation of the hair filaments in the foraminiferal uh, coatings. And then they try to model the calcite, the ferric oxide, and the particulate organic matter. And by the end, they uh, couldn't make sure which was the phase. So they, the model couldn't tell us uh, which the, the, the main phase driving this um, fractionation. But what they suggest is that particulate organic matter could be uh, modeling better the uh, fractionation of her filaments. And indeed, uh, um, since some a few years ago, we see that it's coming up some papers just showing evidence about the scavenging in cold water by marine organic uh, carbon. So uh, these uh, organics are scavenging these elements from the sea water and delivering that to the sea floor. So we do have this evidence and thinking that foraminiferal coatings could reproduce that changes, that scavenging. Uh, we can think that foraminiferal coatings could reproduce that um, in the past, now reproduce these particle reactive changes. And then we could say that her filaments also could be used for tracing these changes in carbon sequestration by marine primary productivity. Also, they are also reproducing that. Um, um, they could be uh, uh, acting as a scavenging phase for these um, foraminiferal coatings. But uh, 
where can we for mini frog coaches to trace this hurricane and cycling? We face some challenges. The first one is that we could face a decrease in the um, oxygen concentrations of the bottom waters and also the sediments, the pool waters. And then we could um, have reducing conditions and then we are going to dissolve your oxides and the elements will be transferred to the uh, poor waters, and then we, um, this could be affecting our reconstruction. The second challenge is related to the water mass mixing, because uh, the water mass has different signature of her filament. So if we have some changes in the circulation and, uh, and the water mass mixing, we could uh, change it. What is firm nephro coatings are red cord. And also um, river input we could have the delivery of uh, solvent hara filaments to the seawater and then could be changing your signature of hara filaments. And then uh, the main idea of this work is basically in three main questions that I'm going to show you now. The first one is that could uh, benthic from nephral coatings from shallow depths record past changes in her filament cycling, why? Because mainly in the works that I have shown for you uh, now, it's uh, only showing about planktonic from nephra. And so far, um, we have uh, only few information about this precipitation in benthic from nephra. So this could be a good try, especially when we are working shallow depths that the abundance of planktonic from nephra uh, it's uh, lower than uh, than um, benthic from nephra, so it could be useful to use this um, benthic to trace it at the her filament cycling changes. The second question it's about what is the most likely process driving this her filament fractionation in from nephra coatings? Could it be uh, changes in redox condition, or uh, could it be the scavenging by organics, as we are um, um, supposing. Um, and the last question is of uh, which mechanism is behind this element cycling variability during the Holocene. Um, uh, to analyze that, uh, to answer these questions, we um, are studying a sediment core and a sediment trap from a western boundary of Wadden system that's in Brazilian margin um, in Cabo Frio, quite, quite close to the Rio de Janeiro. So uh, we are looking for a core and a sediment core and a sediment trap that is um, under influence of the Brazil current dynamics. And Brazil current, uh, um, this is a shallow depth, shallow area. We have here 128 meters depth. And the Brazil current then is transported very warm and oligotrophic um, waters to that side. And in the bottom, we have the South Atlantic Central water that, had, that is a, a water mass that has more nutrients and lower temperature. And, uh, but the Brazil current is dynamic. As you see here in your left-hand side, um, Brazil current move quite close and far from the continental shelf. So these changes in the uh, position of the Brazil current is driving upwelling in this area. So when we have the offshore uh, movement of the Brazil current, we create like a space for the bottom waters upwell and also this uh, uh, bottom water upwells and reach the elphotic zone, we have then an increase in primary productivity and the carbon exportation to the seafloor. Uh, and this variability, it's seasonal. It's uh, the upwelling process, it's occurring during the summer, the austral summer. Then here is, uh, we do have samples from uh, planktonic foraminifera from the sediment trap. So what it means that the living planktonic foraminifera, they, those are not, uh, have not reached the sea floor yet. And we also have analyzed planktonic and benthic foraminifera from a sediment core nearby. Uh, and we compare them. So these are the methods that we use in the starting for our right hand side. Um, we have analyzed it in the, in the sediment core, mixing benthic uh, and mixing planktonic from nephral coatings, and we analyzed the her filaments plus uh, some trace elements as manganese and um, uranium. And then um, coming to the um, 
left hand side, you're going to see that we have also now isotope stabilizer topes from Bentec, from Mifras, Ibsid School and Bergy. And in the, in the top and the left, you are going to see that we also did the Bentec from Mifras accumulation rate. That's a well known proxy between the Bentec from Mifras community because it's a proxy that reconstructs this. Uh, uh, organic carbon exportation to the sea floor to reduce increases on the uh, primary productivity. And the density, uh, this is mainly based that if we have more food available being delivered to the sea floor, then we are going to uh, have an increase in the density of the benthic forums and the benthic organisms in the bottom. So we applied before index year um, as a carbon exportation proxy because this um, upwelling system mainly is what is uh, the organics that are dominant there are come from this uh, marine organic carbon from this system of upwelling. Then go to the results and uh, trying to answer uh, the first question is that if uh, Bentec from nephral coatings could then uh, record these changes in her affluent cycling. We are starting uh, comparing the sediment trap uh, values of um, uh, manganese and her filaments, and we see that we have quite low concentrations when we compare with the sediment core of benthic and planktonic formifera. They uh, are showing 10 to 14 fold increase of this concentration in relation to the calcite, and seems that, yes. Um, uh, Bentic from Nifra could be reproducing that her filament cycling, um, as well as have been done with uh, planktonic from Nifra. When we cross plot those concentrations of manganese with new, uh, neodymium, we see here that we have a um, direct relation between uh, those elements. And here we have the low concentration between uh, in, in the sediment trap samples in relation to the um, foraminifera coatings or, or the sedimentary foraminifera. And we see that uh, this good relation could be endorsing this idea of the autogenic oxides precipitating that. And in your uh, right hand side, you see then the profiles from our samples starting from the bottom. Uh, in green lines, you see here all uh, sediment trap planktonic formifera. And what you can see is that we have a flat shape of the her filaments profile that's uh, different from your um, formiferal coatings that we can see here, that we have a positive serum anomaly and also an increase in uh, mid her filaments in, compar in comparison to the have her filaments. And then we look, when we compare the, those shapes with uh, those format here from iron manganese oxides and marine organics, we see that there are some similarities, but it seems that from inferior coatings are expressing more the profile that is shown here by marine organics. So it's just given again that idea that from inferior coatings could uh, trace the scavenging uh, by organics from seawater. Then as early as in our first question, yes, as planktonics, the benthic from nephro uh, uh, coatings can also represent the her filament cycling. Uh, going to now to the trying to answer the second question, that's the most likely process that's driving this fractionation of her filaments. We started looking for if we do have redox changes controlling the her filaments in the foraminifera coatings. And we start here uh, looking for your reconstruction now. Uh, we do have um, 90,000 years of reconstructions. And here in the top, we have the serum anomaly, followed by the here in purple, the half lights her filaments. That's followed here by the um, reconstruction of mid her filament anomaly. And by the end, the Renu calcium. And Renu calcium is a um, redox uh, proxy. So it means that if we have a reducing conditions, we would face increasing concentrations in uranium. And, um, but what we see here is that we have very low uh, uh, values of uranium calcium ratio. So that means that it's suggesting that we do not have changes in uh, redox. So we, we do have oxygen, oxygen 
um, available in this environment. And this is also suggested by the serial anomaly. We do have a positive anomaly. That means that the uh, serum is uh, in the, is, or um, oxidate form. And um, in agreement also with this interpretation, we also have some uh, previous uh, works in the area that's showing uh, that sulfur cycling also supports this idea of um, high oxygen conditions in this upwelling system. So yeah, we can say that uh, we don't have redox changes during these times. We have evidence for well oxygenated con conditions during these um, 9,000 years. And then uh, we are going to look if we, we could be facing changes in uh, circulation or if the welling could be changes these patterns of her elements. And uh, we compare our patterns with the stable isotopes from CBC school in Beijing. What we see is that the average of these values are quite uh, flat and is not expressing um, uh, some uh, variations, some strong variations over this time. And when we compare that with the modern conditions, actually the last two centuries, we see that uh, CBC school in Berger is showing some very similar values of stable isotopes. So what, is mean, what this means that um, could mean that we do have a modern bottom water circulation persisting uh, throughout the Holocene. So perhaps this is not the, the main um, process that's influenced the her filament part. But uh, then we uh, try to um, see if river inputs could be um, changing your patterns. Then um, when we look um, now more closely to your serum anomaly in your headlights, her, her filaments, we see that the variability is, seems uh, similar, especially in the peaks here that you are going to see after uh, better. And, but it, the mid her filament anomaly, uh, it's not expressing the same variability. Actually, the mid her filaments are quite uh, closer to the highlight content in a sediment core nearby. And um, then uh, the first thing that comes um, into my mind is that we do have a different process driving serial anomaly and have light her filaments in comparison to the mid her filaments anomaly. The values are um, quite high for the anomaly, and this could be uh, showing us some uh, river influence. But uh, even if the, we do have this river influence, it, the variability is not the same. And also Brazil current is quite strong and uh, it's very uh, dynamic in this area, as I told you, it's influenced the continental shelf and it's also the Brazil current pushes the um, uh, plums and the coastal waters uh, to the coastline. Uh, more close to the coastline. So that uh, shouldn't uh, be influenced a lot your um, site. Then um, your conclusion based on that is that the river uh, could be influenced, but uh, it doesn't seem to explain your variability that we are seeing with serial anomaly and have light her filaments. By the end, then we, um, we went to analyze your uh, possibility to have the scavenging by organics influencing our her filaments pattern. Then we compare serial anomaly and have lights her filaments ratio with the before index. And what we have is that a good agreement between um, um, these proxies. So this is suggesting us that yes, organics, these organics that are being exported to the seafloor could be driving this variability. And when we plot them together, here in the black, you can see the black line is showing the before variability over uh, the Holocene. And it's matching exactly the tendency of serial anomaly. And also it's matching the same peaks here. So this means that the organics that is, is being delivered to the bottom because of this upwelling process, it's scavenging the lights and serum from seawater and is delivering that to the seafloor. And then after the mineralization, they are providing that those elements to the pool waters. And also we have this oxygen, uh, high oxygen conditions in the bottom waters then 
these elements are being delivered into the um, associated to the uh, Ferminifero coatings. And then we can say that coatings are reflecting the bottom water mass uh, her effluent signature that's set by this organic carbon scavenging. Um, then concluding then this uh, question, uh, we can say that we have this high composition of, of the uh, firmiferal coatings um, that's dominantly controlled by the particle organic carbon scavenging. And we only could reach that because of the before index, uh, the benthic firmiferal uh, uh, showed some quick and very good uh, records of these uh, changes in primary productivity and carbon exportation from this upwelling system. And this um, quick um, response from the Bentec community, it's because of this um, inputs of uh, fresh organic carbon and because uh, this is seasonal. So we have um, increase in the abundance and the density of the opportunistic species as global Cassidulina subiglobosa. That's the, the dominant species in the area. So as we have the seasonal inputs, this is a, a kind of species that reproduce it quite quickly. And then they um, support these uh, changes in the food supply and um, enjoy this environment of uh, very high uh, organic carbon being delivered to sea floor. That's why we have this good uh, reconstruction of before just showing these inputs to the sea floor. Um, and then uh, to answer your last question about which mechanism could be uh, behind that, we um, have analyzed the frequency of this variability of before index after uh, 6,000 years. And what we see is that we have a millennium scale variability. So the peaks are uh, being moving in a millennium scale um, oscillation. That means that the organic carbon that is being exported to seafloor and also the scavenging of her filaments have been part of a climate, um, global climate um, uh, condition. And then we analyze it your before together with some other reconstruction. So we starting here with the orange reconstruction, that's the magnesium calcium SST, the sea surface temperature from the core that is a little bit uh, to the, the sulfur part on the Brazilian margin, but it's still expressing the Brazil current strain. So what do we see is that we have peaks and the increase of uh, sea surface temperature that's matching exactly your before peaks over uh, the time. And um, this before peaks, so it's in exactly in agreement with what we, um, what I have told you before. So we have an increase in temperature in sea surface. So we have an increase on the Brazil current strain and also the Brazil current strain and it, uh, Brazil current moves offshore um, in relation to your core. And then we have this upwelling process occurring. So this is matching exactly our variability um, here that we are seeing with the peaks here in orange and also the before. And then it's as expected is going to the opposite to this green one. That's the sea surface temperature from uh, the same core that we are looking at before. So it is showing that we have an increase on the upwelling intensification. So we have a decrease on sea surface temperature when uh, because of this upwelling process occurring. And we can say that uh, also that this upwelling is also influenced by this northwest winds intensification that's driving this strengthening of the pursuit current. Uh, and then we can see that your before records is also matching the spilotems records from central eastern Brazil. You can see there in the top in the letter uh, A the black and brown reconstructions are delta oxygen and tinfoil spilotems in the central western Brazil. And we can see that the, the gray bars are here as just showing the exact timing when we have uh, um, the peaks of delta oxygen and tin that's matching exactly the peaks of the before index showing 
that um, increase on the organic uh, exportation to the sea floor. So what we can think about that is that we have the same uh, uh, process, the same mechanism driving good variability. So it's as the same as is driving the changes in Brazil current strain. Northeast winds is also improving this um, continental rainfall, the precipitation in the central east Brazil. And uh, we also compare these reconstructions with the sea surface temperature in the North Atlantic. Um, so uh, this is going in um, opposed way. Then we have a cooler sea surface temperature when uh, we have an increase in temperature in Brazil, uh, uh, current increase in strain, and also increase of carbon being exported in Brazil margin. So we do have this asymmetric temperature that um, it uh, could be uh, driving those changes of uh, the changes of the uh, intertropical convergence zone. So this moving so far and also this intensifying the northeast winds. So what we can see from that is that our records or of before, it's part of a regional climate that's very sensitive to the uh, changes in the um, North Atlantic um, conditions, the climate that is cited by the um, North Hemisphere. Then uh, for as a take home message, um, as our first question, and also just coming at up, um, her elements are associated as a with the post-mortem autogenic precipitations and benthic foraminifera, and then we can use and we can apply benthic foraminifera coatings to record those changes in her filament cycling. Um, and also uh, scavenging bioorganics is the most likely process that are responsible for this her filament fractionation record by the foraminifera coatings. And then by the end, your record is in correspondence with the Central East records of the speed of Thames in Brazil and also the North Atlantic sea surface temperature. This means that uh, uh, we have an interhemispheric ocean atmospheric control on the carbon exportation in Brazil margin and also the higher effluent cycling in shallow depths. So if you want to see more discussions about that, you can go to your uh, paper published in last year. And uh, also you can email me and I will be really happy to uh, discuss more about her filament cycling with you. Thank you very much for your attention and your presence today. Well, Bruna, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, now we can go with questions. If you, any of you have any question, you can raise your hand, open your microphone, <laughs> or you can type it in the chat. In the meantime, Bruna, may I ask you? I am I'm, I'm a little bit curious about um, how, how many shells do you need? To produce the the data for for one sample. Well, we we don't need a lot. It depends from um, uh, what you're analyzing. But in this case, we have used a couple of, of forums, like perhaps 300, 400 um, forums. Um, but we can improve that to do with less. It's um, yeah, depending. But it yeah. Uh, we uh, have applied this uh, a great amount actually of forums because we are going to trace it. We trace it also uh, new gene isotopes, and for that we need uh, like a sixty milligrams of forums. That's a lot, and uh, and then but uh, we apply. We already have analyzed it, but uh, we can do that with very less forums. So we have the first question by, oh, let me. Devish, uh, would like to open your microphone and ask? Yeah, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to ask what I have written in the chat box. 
We have the planktic foraminifera depth stratified, those living at the very shallow water, and those in thermocline and then deep water. Once they all reach the sediment uh, water interface at the top of the sediments, uh, their residence time in the water column is different uh, once they uh, fall. So is there a difference in uh, the coating, uh, particularly with respect to neodymium? And can this uh, ND isotope be used to know the past depth of the extinct forms? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as I have shown it, the concentration that's related to the calcite, it's very low. Uh, but um, once they reach the C4, they will have that signature that uh, uh, concentration increases and in the, in the, um, in the foraminiferal coatings. Then we would assume that the precipitation we start at the time that the, the forums reach the C4 then uh, difference in the ecology of uh, planktonic foraminifera shouldn't uh, express, be expressed because if they both uh, different species from different ecology that arrive at the same time, they would have similar concentrations. But you know, uh, we need more studies to, uh, to face that because what I was seeing comparing also the benthic and, and planktonic is that we can have some difference between them. And then no one knows yet if uh, we could have some difference in, the, in terms of ecology because it, at some point, what I think is that uh, the surface area, it's more important at this point than the ecology, but uh, how to, you know, to uh, make sure of that is just going deep into that and doing more studies. But uh, what I can tell you so far that it, it shouldn't, we could see the same concentration of neodymium in from nephrocotase from different species, at least between the plantics. Thank you. Well, so maybe we can go for the next question. We have a comment from Ezidini. Uh, thank you for your talk. Oh, uh, there is one raised hand, I think, from Johan. Johan, if you want, please. I'd like to pose a question. Um, actually, two questions. Um, one is, um, how do you extract uh, the rare earth elements uh, from the manganese coating uh, is it during the uh, reductive step in the cleaning process? No, actually, we analyze it um, just uh, doing a very uh, quick cleaning. We just take the uh, sediments and the uh, what we see of siliciclastic contamination, and that's all. We analyze it together, the forums. That still with that we sometimes we can see some autogenic precipitations because sometimes it's like a, a brownish color and we analyze that everything together because this concentration are very low in in the calcite so it's together the coatings with the calcite. Yes, yes, I know these coatings very well. They look like tiny black dots on, on the outside and uh, they are very persistent and you find them all over, uh, even in greater depths of sediment core. Uh, the other question is, um, I was quite surprised seeing such a variability in cerium, but not uh, a concomitant variability in uranium. 
because if uh, if the rare earth elements would uh, mainly be delivered by organic particles, by organic substances, this should be mirrored in the uranium as well. Or is it a matter of uh, the, uh, the scaling of your plot that there is a covariance of cerium and uranium, but we don't see it or it has not been displayed for this purpose here? Yeah. Um... I, I, yeah, that's a good question. But, uh, you know, we, although we have a, a huge increase on the organics being delivered, we still have these oxygen conditions. And to increase the uranium, we must have a, the oxygenic uranium, that's, that's what I'm meaning. We need to have reducing conditions for we have the precipitation of uranium. So if we are not seeing, uh, any changes in the ratio of uranium calcium, it's very low. Um, we can say that actually we don't have changes in the, uh, we don't have changes in the oxygen concentration. So the cerium will be delivered and quickly precipitated uh, together with the uh, ferminiferal coatings. So it shouldn't follow um, exactly the uranium uh, Actually, uranium must be low to just endorse that oxygen conditions, and then cerium will be delivered quickly to these oxygen particles in the sediment. So I see okay. in this form. Mm -hmm. So, so the cerium uh, is incorporated in a kind of, uh, in a kind of a direct pathway within, say, months or or a couple of years, and the uranium needs to be deposited. Uh, redox changed and, and and after it's delivered and and so it's blurred. I mean, then then it's gone. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's thank a great you. Study. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you and your comments too. So we have another comment by Jay Z. All right. Uh, excellent talk, Bruna. Congrats and by Katja. Uh, great, Runa. <laughs> Thank you, Katja. In the meantime, may I ask, uh, Runa, do you do you intend to apply these studies uh, on deeper cores and um, like deeper in in water depth and uh, in time as well? Oh, great question. Thank you. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, because uh, her filament cycling uh, still so many lack is uh, lacking knowledge. We cannot know if uh, we could be facing these changes in every single depth in the ocean. So it's coming up some uh, papers that showing that could be happening. This scavenging by organics could be happening in shallow and in intermediate waters. Um, then the idea is try to continue looking for that and um, using the ferminiferal coatings to see if we can trace it at and uh, comparing with a good proxy of primary productivity as before, probably, and because it works really well in this, in this um, approach. And uh, the idea is continue to try to see if we have um, any other process that could be influenced as, because so far we don't know what, for example, if changes in the bioturbation could make some variability in this her filament patterns in Permifra. And also if we go close to the river, how could, could be these changes in the her filament pattern? So we want to uh, try to address some more questions that we have. And um, in the future, so I hope if someone has some any insights, so please you can also uh, email me. I will be very happy to have some discussions about that too. That's good. <laughs> so maybe we can wait a little bit more if someone else has a question. We have a comment from Malcolm. Many thanks. I'm, I'm going to read it. Uh, or My Malcolm, do you want to to open your mic and? Hi there, Bruna. Hello, Malcolm. Nice to see you. Thanks for your talk. 
uh, we did something similar to this, which is what my me method, message was. Um, and we were trying to use laser ablation analytical techniques, but it was far too slow, far too expensive. And so we gave up. Um, but the results we got were, might have been promising if I was enough of a geochemist to have followed them up. Um, but I certainly enjoyed the, the presentation you gave. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for our comment. Yeah, laser ambition should show that too. And you can uh, see uh, exactly in the, where these uh, elements are concentration. But uh, I, I completely understand that you that uh, uh, takes time. And also, it's not so, uh, you know, it's quite expensive to, to analyze it, but uh, it's nice to. Yeah, know I mean, the thing that we were looking at was we were trying to avoid any anomalies created by the last chamber effect in, in foraminifera, um, and therefore doing the laser ablation on earlier chambers rather than relying on that last one, which seemed to give an anomalous result. But anyway, it, it, it didn't go very far apart from showing us what, pre what things were present. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to discuss more or talk, so you can email me and we can chat more about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Your microphone is off, Jaime. <laughs> Thank you. So I think if we have no more questions, maybe we can um, close the question session and go to the to do some uh, publicity for next uh, talk. We cannot hear you, Anika. Oh, hi. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so our next talk will be on the 12th of August um, from Chiaman Pataroyo um, about Maastrichtian forums. So uh, we're looking forward to see you all there. Uh, and if no one has any more questions, then I'd like to thank Bruna again for a really interesting talk. Uh, I'm, looking for, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the results coming out of this project. So thank you everyone, and hopefully see you in two weeks. See you there. Bye-bye. Just want to say thank you. Great talk. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation again. Hi, me and Enki. I hope that I was pronouncing it properly. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy. And it was our, our pleasure.